All right, we're here. We're in the lab. It's Jared Lee Gosselin. How are you? I'm, I'm doing pretty good, man. I'm doing Fantastic. pretty good. Fantastic. We're so excited. Under the bridge. Yeah, man. Gino Excel, what another level. I'm looking at your credits, man. i got to ask you, how you got involved in music? What was some of the steps in life? What was some of the music you heard? What drew you to mm. dedicate your life to this? I mean, I, I guess when I, was, when I was little, my mom... She played the White Album for me. <laughs> and that was one of those records that was just like, I remember like laying in bed, really, really small, hearing that record all the time, you know? And that was probably one of the first things that was like, oh my God, this is like amazing, you know? Genius. And every song sounds different. You listen yeah. to that album, it's like 24 shades of genius. Yeah, man. That's, yeah, it's such an amazing record. Such an amazing record. So that was like the, probably the first thing that I can remember as like, being really, really small, mm -hmm. you know? And then um, just, like, you know, growing up, you know, I'm from Detroit. Growing up in Detroit, it's, like, you know, there's lots of snow. Most people are inside, and they're either, you know, learning how to play an instrument or they're, like, occupying their time with something like that. So, you know, for me, it was, like, I learned how to play guitar, and I would just sit at home and play guitar all day, you know? And then when I got into, I think I was in, like, junior high school, it was about, like, 16, there was this girl that I knew, and she was, like, She's like, what are you going to do? She's like, whatever you're going to do, you just have to do it. And it was like one of those moments I was like, I was like, all right, well, this is it then. This is what I'm going to do. Yeah. And um, Life's too short yeah. to not try. Yeah, man. You know, like when I was, you know, like, like the first cassette that I bought was mm -hmm. Run DMC, Raisin' Hell. Mm -hmm. So that, and then I had Public Enemy, It Takes a Nation of Millions. Like those mm -hmm. were like the first cassettes that I had as a kid growing up. So, yeah. um, you know, like the thought of being like a DJ and scratching records was like, I had dreams of that when I was young. So I was really... That was something that I was just like, oh my god, I have to! I can't wait to get turntables. Like, I'm gonna get turntables and I'm gonna scratch records mm -hmm. and you know. So, you know, I was playing guitar, started DJing, and then a really good friend of mine, um, Giuseppe, that I went, me and him grew up together, went to high school together, and we ended up going to recording school together. We had a band and stuff, and he ended up dying of a drug overdose. So like, you know, we had like some drug issue, like problems like growing up, and mm -hmm. um, you know, we went to school. We were interning for all the old Motown writers together. Mm -hmm. Started working with like D12 and Eminem and all those guys. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I ended up getting clean and then he couldn't get clean. And he was like, if I can't get clean, I'm not going to be around you because I don't want to take bring you down, you know? And, um, dude, yeah. And then he ended up passing away and I just continued, you know, continued on the path. So, yeah. you know, it's been a journey. Well, you know, music is universal, but obviously there's a lot of history to... Detroit, you know, and, and the sound, you know, Motown and all the rock and roll. I mean, you look at the rock and roll history and Alice Cooper band was living in Phoenix, but it wasn't until they moved to Detroit that they, you know, changed the world. And yeah, man. MC5 and Iggy Pop and the Stooges and Ted Nugent. Absolutely. And, you know, all that, that raw, you know, blue collar, you know, music. Obviously, the Motor City is obviously always known for that gritty, you know, sound and, um, Tell us about meeting, you know, Proof and, you know, what it was like uh, collaborating with him. Because we obviously know he was an important part of M's life, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, how did you guys click? Well, man, God, it was, it's kind of crazy, man. Like, um, I used to see him at one of the studios that I used to work at all the time. And it was this was, like, back when he was with, like, Maurice Malone in the hip-hop shop days. And, I mean, he had his dreads, and he just had this energy about him. Like, you would see him, and he would just be like on the go, you know, mm. like the vibe, you were just like, man, like there's something about that dude, you know? And um, it wasn't until like some years later, like like the late 90s, like 99, 2000, when we like really connected. And um, I mean, it was kind of a trip, man. Like I was working for this dude and I built this guy's studio and then I ended up getting connected to Proof through that. Mm -hmm. And um, the guy that I was working for, unfortunately, he got murdered. And I was at the guy's house the day that he got killed. Mm. And um, he was like, you know, him and his brother were, you know, in like a, you know, old school gangsters, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, I went to Proof's house that night. And then that night, it was on the news. And then from that point on, I was just, I was with Proof. And we opened up a studio together. And that was kind of it, man. After that, that was like the moment where it was just like, he was like, you're with us now. It was like that kind of thing. It was weird. Yeah. yeah. Bust into the gang. Mm -hmm. So searching for Jerry Garcia, you know, 
talk about making making that and you know what Man, what that, that did to help process. you what that, what that do to help you you know be who you are Man, it was definitely like a learning process of like, I guess who I am and what I was going to do, you know, because a lot of the stuff that I was doing was like, it was kind of like pre me, like really like producing records. Like I was learning how to produce records and, and I just got out of school for engineering and I was like learning from all the guys, you know, like Denine and Dilla and all the guys in Detroit that we would get records from mm-hmm. and um, fixing people's production and like fixing the samples or recutting the samples and you know, making the drums sound right or fixing the drums, replacing the drums. So, like, learning how to do all of those little things to make something sound sonically right um, was a big thing for me, you know, because then I was like, I could do this because I'm making everybody else's stuff sound great. So there's no reason that I can't just do it myself. And that was, like, from that point on, I was like, okay, that was that was it for me. It was, like, a turning point for sure. Mm. And And seeing that relationship between... Proof and M, what what role did you see, you know, Proof in that relationship? You know, obviously, M's life was changed, you know, when he lost him. But, I mean, coming up. It was like a up, balance. Yeah. It seemed like it was like a balance, you know. There was like a, there was something that, that he gave him that, like, leveled him out, I think, in a way. Mm-hmm. You know, or like, you know, he like had his back, really, you know, I think more than anybody else. No, yeah, well, we see that in the 8 Mile movie, you know, where, mm-hmm. you know, Proof kind of gave him that credibility when people would obviously check him for being this little white dude you know coming up but yeah obviously we know music comes in all shades and ages and colors and i always say there's two kinds of music music that moves you and music that doesn't so mm-hmm. you know it I has to move you i mean that's yeah that's i mean it's all about growing up with the beatles you know and you, you gotta dig some deep roots man to build a tall tree you know absolutely man. you know and what, what are some of the other styles of music that people might be surprised that you get into or I mean I'm a jazz from. head I mean I love jazz <clears throat> I mean that's probably like one of my favorite like probably one of my favorite genres of music mm-hmm. more than you know a lot of like I mean I love Sade mm-hmm. she's probably like one of my favorites you know I love Miles Davis and Ornette Coleman and you know Cannonball Adderley and um, you know Monk and you know I like a lot of that stuff mm-hmm. and I've worked with like some of like the <clears throat> old school jazz guys in Detroit and you know, I love, like, Yusuf Latif and, you mm-hmm. know, Tribe and, you know, a lot of that old stuff, man, I love. Yeah. Well, it's definitely something real deep that you can draw from because they obviously were doing their own thing. They weren't following anybody's path. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. No, bring us up to date. Tell us about the new company. Tell us about this exciting new release, Under the Bridge, and working cool. with our boy Chino. Yeah, man. Well... Um, you know, this song has been a long time coming and I've, I've, I've kind of had it in my back pocket for a minute and kind of been like refining it and making it, you know, making it right to where we're like, man, you know, tweaking it, changing the drums, moving stuff around until we're like a hundred percent happy with the record. And, um, I started this new company with, um, a couple friends of mine called 1520 Entertainment. Um, we have What's a, the significance of the name? 1520, um, Sedgwick Avenue being the birthplace of hip hop where okay. they say Cool Herc had the first party in, in um, you know, in the Bronx. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of where we got the name from. Mm-hmm. So, you know, not everything we're doing is necessarily hip hop. Like we have some, some R&B stuff and there's some EDM stuff. There's hip hop. I mean, it's, it's a mixture of everything. I mean, even with the Chino release, we have a, a series of, you know, trap remixes and stuff that's more in like the electronic space too Mm -hmm. you know just to kind of bridge more of a gap you know with the music and not just be like in one place but spread it out to kids that don't know who he is too Mm -hmm. you know and to open it up to different fan bases which you know i think is important you know and there's so many ways to do that now but with remixes and packaging things a certain way and so you know you know i'm pretty excited about that but um yeah 1520 is the label the studio facility uh it's called the Fab Factory, mm-hmm. and uh, we have a lot of stuff coming out, man. So this is the first one. <laughs> we have the EP with Ron Mancino called "A Bad Day for Sorry," which we're kind of finishing up right now too. It'll be it, it'll be probably uh, available later on this year. Um, and yeah, man, there's a lot of good stuff coming. Yeah, yeah. See, creative space. You got the art. You got the ideas to incorporate. You know, film and visuals and all, all sorts of stuff. I mean, the the business is changing so much where 
you know, small teams can do do a lot. Well, what, I mean, what's I, your I mean, most exciting whole thing, thing about you know the whole indie I entrepreneurial mean, for style. us right now? Like our whole thing from the beginning, and like I've had this idea for a while where I've wanted to have like a three hundred and sixty facility where it's like we have recording studios, we have stages to do music videos and to do television shows, we have radio rooms where we can go on the air and we can. You know, we have personalities on board. Mm -hmm. We have our in-house PR. We have our label in-house. So it's like, you know, we have everything here. We have our management company is 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 part of our is part of the label as well. Um, you know, we're just creating the publishing arm right now too. So it's it's literally everything. It's like we could do anything from you want to write a book to putting out an album to putting out a TV show or a film, all in-house. Yeah. You know. That's that's truly exciting. Now, obviously, for those that don't know Chino XL, they've been living on a rock somewhere. Easily one of the most underrated lyricists, most powerhouse, you know, characters, you know, in the history of hip hop. Now, how did you guys cross paths, and what is it about him that made this a perfect move for you? <clears throat> well, we met through Proof. We met through Proof years ago. And, um, you know, Proof would come out to L.A., and it was when I first moved out here, and he would always be like, oh, Jared, I'm going to come see you out in L.A., and, we, you know, we would hang out. And uh, he would call me, and he'd be like, he'd be like yo, Chino. I'm like, like, Proof, this is Jared. Like, this isn't Chino. This is before I even knew Chino. And then I, I was producing another artist, and they ended up bringing Chino in to do a record. And then from that point on, we just became friends. And I was like, yo, Proof would call me thinking it was you. And he's like, yo, that's crazy. <laughs> Because you would have the same kind of thing happen to him. And um, we've just been friends ever since, man. It's been, like, at least a good, like, God, 10 years or so. Yeah. Maybe more. So, yeah, you know, we just always stayed up. I helped, You know, I worked on his last record mm -hmm. when I was working out of the Zappa studio. And we uh, did his last record there. And, you know, now here we are. And yeah. I'm glad for him to be the first release, you know. Because, I mean, he's definitely one of the best uh, to ever do it. So, yeah. you know, it's fantastic. Perfect timing. So now, under the bridge, you, you you're telling me earlier, but let's let's tell the viewers, you know, the story of how you guys kicked it around and ended up reinterpolating it. Well, when I was doing the reconstruction album, which you know, we were talking about, um, he kept on asking me to sample it. He was like, "Yo, he's like, you got to sample under the bridge and make and, and put a beat behind it, and then you know, I'll I'll do a record to it." And we just didn't get a chance to do it. Like we were working on the album. I had so much going on when I was working at that studio because I was producing and mixing records for the Zappas and I was also trying to like do my own projects at the same time and I was producing a lot of stuff so it was just it was really hard for me to work on any other productions really. So even though to sample it would have took like 10 minutes to, to put it together, you know, you want to do something. It's usually the other way around. We sampled it because we didn't have time to replay it. You <laughs> replayed it because you didn't have time to sample it. <laughs> well, I replayed it because I don't want to clear a sample. Well, well, that's it. <laughs> I always say it seems like a shortcut taken off a record, and then it could be a month or a year before another party says yay or nay. Well, back in the day, what I would do is I would sample first, and then I would, re and then I would slowly start to replace the samples with the original. Either change the parts around, mm -hmm. use it for like a placeholder, and then change the chord progressions and, and lay the live parts down and the drums and everything else. Um, and then I just totally stop sampling. Like I, yeah. I rarely sample anything now because I can replay anything. You know, yeah, why give up all that publishing and headaches? Yeah, and I mean, you know, it's it's one thing if you remake a song and it's all original because you still it's a new master and you have your master now. You know, you that you, yeah. can, that you control. Otherwise, you're at the mercy of the label and them owning part of that master still. Yeah. So. You know, it's, it's, and then it gets used in a movie. It's a whole nother. Yeah, it's a pain. Issues. It's a pain in the butt. So this way, for me, it's easier. You know, it makes more sense. Yeah, was well, exciting song, and like we were talking about earlier, I mean, it was that breakthrough for Red Hot Chili Peppers. The first time Anthony Kiedis ever found that melancholy voice because he was just known for the frantic, up tempo, crazy punk funk. Thing, yeah, you know, with George Clinton and all that. So. Um, you know, it was obviously a huge record for the MTV generation. And oh, absolutely. I, I'm, you know, still one of the highlights is, as Red Hot Chili Peppers are playing at Three Nights Dance at Staples Center while we speak here. You know, um, obviously one of the highlights of the set. So, um, perfect, perfect song, you know. What can you tell us about the rest of the EP? What other styles and shades can we expect? It's going to be hard-hitting. It's going to be hard-hitting. Like, um... 
kind of like the reference that I had for the record was the. Um, did you ever hear that "One Day as a Lion"? Mm-hmm. It was with uh, yeah. with, Zach. with Zach and uh, what's the drum, the drummer from Mars Volta? I can't remember yeah, his name. I forget his name. But um, like even like back when we first were talking about doing something, I was like, man, I want to do something like this record because mm-hmm. that record was so dope. Cause it was like hard drums like a wicked keyboard like bass or like a guitar like real real simple like just ill riffs and hard drums and just dope vocals you know simple simple so it's going to be some stuff on uh, you know on those lines but for now you know it's not going to be what that was it's going to be something different but the inspiration kind of comes from there for sure the vibe Mm -hmm. of what Mm -hmm. we were talking about so yeah well that's truly exciting now for the young producers young creative people coming up obviously we're telling them that it's a whole new business world. You know, if you can dream it and pull it off, you can, you can do whatever you want. But what advice do you have them coming up? Because with the technology, a lot of people are looking for a shortcut. They just want to, you know, click and 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 all that. Obviously, you paid a lot of dues. The people we're talking about paid a lot of dues. Uh, what what advice do you have to young creative people coming up today or producers following in your footsteps? I mean, I guess it's just to really always be forward thinking and find find a new way. I mean, that's what it's all about. It's finding the new way to do something um, and being inventive, you know. And, you know, having a great team and building a great team, um, you know, that's everything as well. You know, you have to have the right infrastructure, you know, because you could be terrible with the right infrastructure and you could win. You know, not to say that people, everybody's terrible, but mm-hmm. you could, you know, it happens, it happens all the time. It's like the team is... The team is a really, really, really big part of it. And it's just, you know, study your craft. I think a lot of kids that are out there, they just don't know about as much stuff. Like, back in the day with us, it was like, we're digging through records and, you know, researching stuff. Where now everybody's just like online. We'd be like in stores, you know, with our mm-hmm. little, our little, you know, record yeah. players listening to stuff, trying to find out, like, you know, find those cool, rare records that nobody's ever heard of, you know? And um, that's what it was all about, you know? And, uh... It's a deep process. There, there was, yeah. you know, it was, a, it, was a, it was an adventure. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I used to travel all over the all over the the country, just digging for records and finding mm-hmm. old record stores that were going out of business, and mm-hmm. you know, digging through you know urine scented <laughs> basements, you know, climbing over like mountains of records, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but that's what it was all about, man. You know, that's what it was all about for me growing up. So, yeah, man, it's just it's just it's just knowing the history respecting the legends and not stopping, you know, always, cause you never know when that tipping point is going to be, when something's going to happen, yeah. you know, and in this era, it's crazy. Like you could literally like some of these kids in like the DJ world, DJ for like two years and they become big. It's, it's, it's much different than one um, for us because it was more like, you know, the hundred thousand hours of work to put in before you had that respect, before you had the knowledge to be able to do something, you know, to put in that work. And now it's like, it you know, it can happen quicker now because technology and everything like you're saying is at such a place where it's like, you don't have to learn how to use a tape machine and an SSL console and, you know, how to sync up all of these drum machines and, you know, to make, to make records. It's, mm-hmm. it's much easier now, you know. It's like a laptop comes with GarageBand, you know. It's like you can record, yeah. you can record you could singing into your laptop if you wanted to, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's crazy. So it's easier to get started, but again, they have to work backwards from there and really not be in a rush to re- really find your, find your style, find your Absolutely. inspirations and, you know, let that come out because it's, uh, like I say, it's kind of a fast food market. If you just click yeah. and paste and, you, you know, there's a, a million records coming out a week, but only few of them really will have any kind of lasting value. Mm-hmm. Yeah, create timeless music. I mean, that's what I always wanted to do was like create stuff that was going to be timeless, that be played forever and sung forever. So, yeah. yeah. And for those producers, creative people on, on a budget, if if you were starting today and you only had a couple thousand dollars with you, what are those pieces? What are the building blocks to start with? I mean, really, all you need is like a. A laptop and Logic or Pro Tools or Ableton and a little controller keyboard and some headphones. That's really it, man. Yeah, that's the beginning. That is the beginning. I mean, you'd be surprised what records that are big records have just been mixed on a laptop. It's it's really crazy. So that's all you need. That's all you need (laughs) to start. (laughs) So fifteen twenty is going to be multimedia. Is going to be yes, sir. Around the around the board, 
can't wait to see Chino out there on on the stages because that's the that's the true test mm -hmm. taking this music directly in front of the festivals and stages yeah. all over the world. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we're putting the band together right now, and it's gonna be a it's gonna be pretty epic. Be epic. Well, Jared, it's a it's a real pleasure. Where can we find you online for the label? Well, um, you can find fifteen twenty entertainment at fifteen twenty entertainment dot com, and on Twitter we're fifteen twenty ent. On Instagram, we're 1520entertainment, and then I'm Jared Lee Goslin. Just Google search it, or on, on Instagram, it's just Jared Lee Goslin, Twitter, Jared Goslin. And that's about it. Well, we can't wait for the next chapter. I'm going to come back here in a year, and we're going to bring it all up to date, because I already know what's growing in the back. Oh, man, the, it's going to be the crazy, The front and man. the sides, so I can't wait to see the progress. We'll archive it and Fantastic, take it to the world. Man. Yeah, that'd be great, man. Thanks so much. Excellent.